welcome everybody to um, our virtual event. Um, you know, the Index Annual Pre Indaba event has become the highlight of the year for me. And I'm actually quite sad not to be able to catch up with you all this year. I've chatted to a lot of people that have been coming to our breakfast and um, I know you all feel the same way. And I was especially looking forward to the lovely breakfast that we normally have. So I'm hoping that we can do that sometime soon. Um, and in the meantime, I hope you've all got yourself a cup of coffee and at least a muffin. We've got three talks today. They're each about 10 to 15 minutes. So we're not gonna take up too much of your time. If you could pop your questions into the chat and we'll read them out to the speakers after each talk. At the end, we'll deal with some more general questions if there are. Um, so I'd like to introduce our first speaker today. Louis Hermeses joined Index as General Manager for Africa in September last year. So he's still very much the new person on the block. He's got an excellent knowledge of the drilling industry and all aspects of business development and driving operational, operational performance, as well as extensive management experience. Before he joined MDEX, he was Chief Operating Officer for Shaft Sinkers Group. Um, oh, sorry, no, I've left out a whole important part where he was with Master Drilling. And before that, he was the Chief Operating Officer for Shaft Sinkers um, and Executive Director for Grinnecker LTA Mining in Business Unit. Lou is a mining engineer by trade, he studied at the University of Pretoria and he also did his MBA there. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Louis. Uh, thank you, Nolien. Uh, morning, everyone. Afternoon and perhaps good evening to some people. Uh, I was contacted during the course of last year and I was asked whether I would like to join a company called Index. The company is listed on the Exterior Stock Exchange and it's active in the drilling and the mining industry. Uh, Index didn't ring a bell immediately in my mind. And I said, give me some time, let me go and do some homework and get back to you. On my investigation, I actually found that uh, Index is the home of AMC, which I was familiar with. Index is also the home of Reflex, which I was familiar with. And to a lesser extent, uh, IO gas as well. And also that, these different products and business entities are actually linked through index up iq into the index table and that's where the caption comes from real-time subsurface solutions uh, the reason for this slide is i think there must be people out there that has the same misunderstanding perhaps in their minds and also some confusion as to what index is all about and i hope by today, by the end of today, you'll understand uh, where, what we are and who we are. But I think in mitigation, one needs to have a look at the history of Index and the path that Index has followed to where we are today. And if you look, you'll see that in 1987, uh, Index was listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, and there was a, a, quite a number of acquisitions done in the meantime. Uh, if I, I stand to be corrected, but I think it's between 20 and 22, but I'm just going to list a few uh, that's, of, that's of more importance connecting to the, uh, the brand categories that we have. Uh, Reflex joined the index table in 2006, and then in 2012, the IO, global IO gas becomes, became part of index. And those three entities basically operated in business silos for the best part from 2012 to 2017. And in 2017, an initiative was launched internally called, called the Index, One Index. And the whole aim and purpose of, of, of that initiative was to ensure that we get the synergies that sits within the, the business unit, so to speak, and that one plus one plus one actually makes five. Uh, we believe that internally we've been fairly successful in getting the one index philosophy going. Uh, but in my view, being very new to the business, I think there's still some work to be done to get that philosophy also accepted and entrenched in our market out there. Then in 2018, uh, index mining technologies, it was not a acquisition, but a division that was formed within the group to get more of a footprint in the production side of mining and uh, to mitigate some of the cyclical revenue nature of the exploration industry. There we'll have the borehole stabilizer, for instance, 
and the blast dog that sits there is technologies in the mining and the mining side of the business. In uh, 2019, uh, FlexiDrill was added to the MDEX table, and with FlexiDrill, we now also have the core vibe as, as part of our product offering, as, as, as well as the extractor. The extractor, for instance, is uh, you can actually inspect your drill bit or replace your drill bit without tripping your drill rods, which is quite an in innovative piece of equipment. And then in late in 2020, uh, the acquisition of OSPEC was made. It is an acquisition that complements our software side, the IOGAS side of the business. Uh, my colleague Sasha Poncho will talk to that later. It's, it's her brainchild, and she can elaborate on what OSPEC is all about. So if one takes this 30, 35 year into consideration, obviously it's been a task to consolidate this and to get this group to maintain its technology leadership and to continue to add value. And as such, there's always internal things that must happen and initiatives that must happen within the business. And there's, there's, there's also changes in the business, uh, like our recent changes in our senior and executive leadership. Bernie Ridgway, uh, mid last year, uh, went into retirement. Uh, he was replaced by Paul House, who was the CEO, is now the chief executive. And another internal promotion was Sean Southwell, who is now the chief operating officer of the group. My predecessor, Justin Moyers, he was transferred to Brisbane in Australia, where he's heading up the commercial process of our, of our products in the market. And I took over from Justin as the general manager for Middle East and Africa. And like Nolene said, the, the paint is still wet on me. In terms of, I just wanted to brief you a bit on internal matters that's happening at the moment. We have two initiatives, management initiative that's on the go and to run into 2021. Uh, these two initiatives run in parallel. The one is the brand and value initiative where the aim is to reposition Imdex as the corporate brand of our business. And that corporate brand will then be supported by the Reflex, the AMC, and the IOGAS brand categories. Obviously, if one addresses the brand and values, the next step will be to have a look at the vision and the purpose of, of the business. And as such, these two initiatives will run in parallel, and the vision and purpose initiative will be to review, refresh, and reset as to where we are and where we're going to. And we believe that these two processes will even further unlock the true potential within the business and make sure that, like I said in the previous slide, one plus one is more than three. What is the vision and purpose then? At this point in time, Index believes we believe we are a leader in the global mining tech business. We're a leading global mining tech company. We have evolved from being in 1987, 1985, a drilling fluid supplier to a company to a company with technology that encompasses the whole mining industry. How will we maintain this leadership? We will continue to invest in and develop our people, and we have to develop and invest even more in the drilling optimization products that we have, and also in the cloud connected sensors, so that we can provide you with real time rock knowledge and quality data. And we believe by doing that, we will continue to, play, to play a critical part in improving the decision-making in the mining, mining industry, but not only, only that, but also promoting the sustain, sustainability and the profitability of the mining operations across the value chain. You've heard me speaking about, about rock knowledge. And when I started with, with, with Imdex, um, there, I sort of get a sense there was Obsession is perhaps a strong word, but there's this real focus on the on the on the on our caption there that says real-time subsurface solutions. And our research shows that one billion dollars worth of mining de investment decisions are actually made on one percent knowledge of the ore body. It's quite scary, <laughs> but if you that that knowledge of the ore body sits in four components. Uh, the first one being the location. Is the rock actually where we believe it is? What is the texture of that rock? And then we would like to know what minerals are contained in there and what grade those minerals are. And we believe that at Index, through our drill holes that we that we that we are involved in and the blast holes, 
we can actually assist you with giving you the data so you can make the decisions of where to next. Do we continue and go deeper here or do we can this whole exploration project or perhaps go on to the next hole and the next one and ensure we then create a onboarding model which is part of our value proposition where you can actually model the all body where it looks like. You can have information at hand to have an optimal mind design. And eventually by the information that you have through the products that we give you, you can actually influence the optimize of influence and optimize your processing plants. So for us, it's important that I'm getting back to my real time again, that we can actually move the whole exploration process forward by quite a number of months. And by doing that, we believe that will play a significant role in from the feasibility phase, the pre-feasibility phase of a project to actually influence the net present value and the IRRs of a mining project and play a role in making that feasible and economical or not. So for us, it's about drilling smarter and faster and knowing your rocks in real time. Obviously, you need to understand then where index, what we believe our value proposition is to the market and how will we maintain that and enhance that value proposition. That basically sits in three, let's call it pillars of the business. The one is drilling optimization. That looks at the drilling fluids and the remote technologies that we have, the building, the drilling productivity and realignment technologies, and also data collection at the drill sites through our dot IQ, where you can actually access anywhere in the world, access information and know what's happening at the drill rig. Are they tripping rods? Are they lowering rods? What's actually happening there? And that gets obviously fed into the hub IQ. As part of our rock knowledge sensors and rock knowledge uh, pillar, we're looking at the downhill sensors, the core orientation and gamma logging technologies, and also our in-field and lab at rig sampling and analysis that we can actually do at the, at the, at the drilling site. And these two, these two pillars then feeds in, feed into the, the index hub IQ, where it gives you the real data, uh, quality data, and you can do your an analytics from, from the information that we provide for you on a secure cloud by software. Everyone then looks at the, at the bottom diagram of, of, the, of the slide in front of you, you will realize that we actually involved from exploration right through to planning and the fragmentation is still a bit vague or it was vague in my mind. And that's where our uh, mining platform comes in. And in there, we have the borehole stabilizer, which is used in the open cast mines. It opens up or it ensures that the drill hole stays open, the blast hole rather, and that it, it uh, reduces re-drilling to be done. It will also have a positive impact on your fragmentation that you have. Also under the mining, uh, mining uh, platform sits the, the blast dog. It's a, it's a technology and a product that actually gives you information of the material you, you, you're drilling through. And it also gives you information on the fractures that exist in the ore and the waste. And by getting, having that information available, one can optimize your blast design and again, it will have a positive impact on the fragmentation, the, the smoothness of your bench, and the downstream benefits that will have will be will be evident in your in your dump hole and and, and uh, operations of, of the open cast mine. So we believe that that our value proposition will have a positive impact on the productivity and efficiency of the drilling contractor, but also your mining operations eventually. It will ensure that you have information available to make decisions quicker. And by the downstream benefits that this creates, you will actually lower your production cost and also your exploration cost. And because of the shorter durations and the impact of the technology, you will reduce your environmental impact you have on your operations. How will we do this? And who, will, who is our ultimate client? It's, it's, we should actually, we are changing our business model and we need to be seen and we need to assist rather our drilling contractors to become more productive, more efficient. That's what we'd like to do. 
and get them down on their cost curve. And similarly, that impact on the productivity and the efficiency that will roll into the resource companies through Hop IQ and will enhance and improve the business process that happens in the background at the resource companies. So Index would like to believe that by creating this tripartite relationship, we actually can collaborate and create collaboration between the three parties and also act as a sort of a glue that all this information is gathered and be, being made available in real time and quality for the ultimate decision making. If one considers everything that I've said up until now, is how will Index maintain its technolo technology leadership and how it will it go into the future and ensure sustainability? First of all, like I've said previously, uh, we will continue to invest and develop our people and we will continue for, with investment in technology to serve the exploration and mining industry. And also, the focus on mining will, will not go away. In fact, it will actually that it will get more of our attention in the future. So our overarching strategy is based on four pillars with, if you look at the center, center square there on the slide, the bottom two is based on our core business, our current business that we have. So we will continue to invest in R&D so that we can enhance our technologies that we have. And by doing that, growing our market and extend our market in our core businesses. To complement this, we need to stay abreast of technology to be able to be so relevant in the future. And as such, the link productivity technologies will be our center of our attention through our core vibe that I've mentioned, the extractor, as well as the MAC hammer, who actually will, is in the trial testing in South Africa, and that'll happen in, in February, March this year. So we're quite excited about that. The software side of the business, is as important as the hardware side. We'll continue our investment into the software. And like I've mentioned, the index mining technology division of the business is very important to us to make sure that we have a, a less cyclical nature in our revenue stream and be active in the mining side as well. So in summary, uh, how do we achieve the strategy? We will continue to look at acquisitions, uh, if it makes business sense to us, if it adds value to ourselves and our clients, as well as our shareholders, we will continue to build on our core businesses and the businesses of the future. And as such, we believe it's important for us to continue playing a role of collaboration between the drilling industry, index value propositions, as well as the ultimate mining houses. I hope that, that I have, by the short introduction to index, cleared some perhaps confusion, like in my case, or a better understanding, created a better understanding for you as to who Index is, who Index was, and where Index is going to, to be of service to everyone. Thank you very much. Any Thanks questions? so much, Louis. Uh, you definitely cleared that up in my mind. Any <laughs> questions? <laughs> Um, okay, so I don't think we have any questions yet. I'm just checking. Nope, still no questions. Um, if anything does come into your minds, you can carry on put, putting them into the chat and we will address them. Our next speaker today um, is Fred Blaine, who has 12 years experience in exploration and mining after receiving a PhD in geochemistry from the University of Waterloo. Beginning his career as a project geochemist with Anglo-American, he has subsequently worked at MDRU and as a consulting geochemist at our Global Index, with a strong focus on data inter integration and data analytics. He has diverse experience across the mining life cycle, and his current role as product, product manager at Index allows him to be at the forefront in development and implementation of new technologies, both in instrumentation and data analytics. He has also been an active participant in multiple cooperative government, industry and research projects. And I'll hand over to you, Fred. Thank you, Nolene. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'll be talking about uh, collecting and integrating uh, near real time data into the logging workflow. So 
just as a bit of a brief introduction to it, um, I think most of us will agree that um, core and chip logging is, is an extremely important aspect of the exploration cycle. Um, and it generates one of some of the earliest information we get within the, the cycle and provides critical early information for decision making. Um, however, I think we also all agree that it has its challenges and room for improvement. So the, the first challenge really is time, and, and this isn't just within um, core logging, um, but rather it's a problem about the entire exploration cycle. Uh, when we look at the cycle, if we if we go through it in an ideal situation, we we drill the rocks, we'd sample the rocks, we'd measure the rocks, and have time to interpret that before we need to make decisions. However, mostly this is isn't the case, that and decisions need to be made much earlier, um, much before we've um, measured and interpreted the the samples. Sometimes the measurement at the labs can take weeks to months and then later on the interpretation after that. So really what we need to do is we need to start getting information and, and data and, and information following on from that earlier in the cycle so that we have the, the data to support those decisions. So core logging kind of sits within the cycle but with, outside of it a bit because it we start right after drilling and we do interpretation and then, but what happens then is we sample the data, we measure the data, and then generally there's a return for a second round of interpretation on that core logging um, after we have more data to inform it. What we what we want to try to do is try to get that data earlier before the core logging to better or to improve that process. Um, so one of the reasons why um, the the quality of logging uh, can, can be um, a little bit less than desired is that uh, the quality of the logging is really dependent on the skill and the experience of the person logging the core. And unfortunately, um, in most cases, the person logging the core isn't the person that we see here, the experienced geologist. Oftentimes, it's one of the younger geologists that um, has, has a bit less uh, experience. Um, and really the, the quality of the logging can suffer from this. Uh, but it's it's a bit two-edged because in some ways it can be a benefit because they're, they're just out of the university, they've just done their petrology courses, the rocks are fresh in their mind, but they, they don't have the, the, the knowledge uh, about and experience about these systems. And also on the other side, the experienced geologists can carry a lot of bias um, in, in their interpretations, and they, they might um, overlook some things be, because of that bias. And, and that leads to the, the third real challenge, and that's how to maintain objectivity, uh, keep consistency in the logging, and to be able to look at multiple scales at the same time. Uh, with core logging, because um, that data is required um, the, the initial co core logging, that data is required quite rapidly to make decisions. Um, it's sometimes focused on, on certain aspects of the core or cr certain critical zones, and sometimes it, it's, it's, its place in the, in the broader scale um, isn't, isn't looked at. So what really, what is the solution to the, these three challenges? And, and the solution is it's collecting data earlier in the cycle. Um, either near real time during the drilling process or during logging and using that data to inform the logging process so that we get better quality data up front when we need to make um, those decisions. So some of the requirements for the data and the uh, information for effective use in logging is it's obviously got to be reliable. Um, it's better if it's quantitative because it opens up some uh, opportunities for um, more advanced analytics on the data. A key aspect um, is that it needs to have rapid turnaround. We have to be able to take the data that we collect and, and convert it into information or knowledge um, very rapidly. If it takes um, a couple of weeks, a week, a couple of weeks to interpret the data and turn it into information, it might as well take a week to collect the data. It's not, it's not really adding that value. For the, on the, information side, um, really what we want is we want objective data. 
um, that it doesn't matter what um, a geologist goes to log the core, they'll get the, the same information, it's objective information. That information has to be repeatable, so any process that we do on it, it has to be um, repeatable both on the data itself, but repeatable on, on the next hole and subsequent holes. And, and lastly, that data has to be accessible and, and in a format that's usable by the logging geologist. So what types of data can we collect um, that we can use in, for logging um, or to inform logging? Um, we can get pr uh, data collected pre-logging. Um, so this can be downhole geophysics, um, for example, data collected by EasyGamma. It can also be data that's collected during logging. And then, so this can be compositional data, which is geochemistry, which you can get from XRF, IFGS, uh, LIBS, and, and like that. Um, and also you can collect data through um, for mineralogy with uh, near infrared and shortwave infrared, um, a bit that uh, Sasha will talk about a bit of in, in her talk a bit later. You can also collect structural data um, using uh, devices such as, as the IQ logger. So for today, what I'm going to look at because of um, some of the approaches that I'm using, um, I'm going to focus primarily on uh, the easy gamma data or total count gamma data. And then each of the, the other ones, they, can, they kind of um, can add into the, uh, this process uh, if, if you're collecting them during logging. So just some uh, easy gamma basics. Um, it's a it's a passive downhole tool. Um, there's no active source. It's it's driller operable. Um, so you don't need a, a specialist logging crew. So you can run it on on any hole anywhere. Uh, what it measures is it's a total count gamma tool, which measures the naturally occurring radiation produced um, in the rocks from the decay of potassium, uranium, and thorium, and its daughter products. And this, this radiation varies by both the lithology and the processes that have interacted with that lithology. Um, it's useful across various deposit types um, and it can be used from direct detection um, if you're looking at things like uranium or mineral sands um, to alteration where you're detecting things like potassic alteration or, or fluid interaction with rocks. And then predominantly, um, and as well as, as lithological discrimination. So natural rocks have different ratios of these three elements, so they give um, different uh, gamma signatures. So this it's a continuous log, continuous downhole log, and using this, you can see subtle variations in the comp composition at, at fine scale on the order of 10 centimeters. And at the same time, it's, it's measuring a larger volume than the core. So it's really getting a more representative look at what the, the rocks surrounding the hole are than, than just what's in the core. So the next challenge after collecting um, these continuous downhole logs is how do we turn that data or that log into usable information? So taking data like this, um, where we have a lot of fine detail in it, um, kind of focusing um, in on what's important in that log and translating it into something that's um, uh, familiar to geologists like like a, a strip log uh, like shown on the left here. So fortunately over the last few years um, there's been some um, really good developments um, in, in the mathematics and analytics and, and um, how to display um, this type of data. And it's also become accessible um, to the geological community. Um, uh, and it, it's now implemented in IOGAS so these, these tools um, can, can be used uh, by anybody that, that, that's using IOGAS. So in this one I'll be talking about today is, is an approach called wavelet tessellation. Um, it uses some complex mass that I, I won't get into, but basically what it does is it's or what it is it's an automated uh, boundary and feature picking algorithm uh, and basically it blocks the data into zones of continuous um, that that are similar and it does this across multiple scales so going from very wide uh, broad features on the right hand side across to to the left 
this whole process can be done in minutes. So it, it's not a, something where you have to interpret the data for, for a week or anything. You can sit down, put the data in, and a couple minutes later, you can come out and you can produce a, a basically what looks like a strip log. And this can be um, given directly to the logger to, to log the core. Um, the process is objective um, and repeatable. It's it's based it's solely data based. Um, there's very little input from the user, aside from potentially choosing the scale that they want to look at. And the other one other thing is that um, it can also identify features which may not be readily visible in the core. Um, and in, invariably, though, the when you look at the the gamma log and you uh, and the wavelet tessellation, and you go back to the core, you'll you'll notice features in the core that might have been um, skipped over or or missed, um, whether they're they're visible or not. But the the gamma can pick things out like cryptic alt alteration, where it's the, it's not visible in the core, but there's a, a compositional uh, change um, in the core or in the rocks. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, one of the strengths of it is it's, it works across variable scales at once. Um, so here we're looking at about a, at a 200 meter section. Um, if we wanted to do a gross interpretation of it, we might pick a scale somewhere here around five, go through, and we can do a very broad scale um, look at, at that log and break it into uh, four or five different units at that scale. And that's our, our gross lithological log. If we want to start going in smaller, so this is looking at a 50 meter scale, we might, uh, sorry, a 50 meter interval, we might pick a smaller scale and then we start breaking that down. And if we find a, a zone of interest, we can zoom in e even further and start looking at the fine scale features and start picking out these, these features uh, with, within, within the log. So it, it, allows a lot of, of flexibility on on how on the, the amount of detail you want within different regions of the core and allows you to look at the the large picture um, so we just go on um, so taking it one step further from just looking at the the raw uh, wavelet plots um, within IOGAS, um, you can select a scale that you're interested in. So if you're, you're looking at a scale um, uh, interval here of 100 meters, we can choose a scale of 1.5, which draws a line up through, sorry, if I can keep straight, up through here. And then um, we can convert that into um, a numeric column that we then can do further analytics on or clustering on and generate uh, a geology log basically from from that data that can then then be printed out at that scale and and as i said if you want to look at any of these in in finer detail you can just go to a, a smaller scale and and um, get more detail within any of those zones so as i said all all this um, this workflow uh, can can be done within iogas so really the the goal of this is to take sorry, is to use this information to generate these pseudo logs or quick logs or, or strip logs and put that in, on a device in the hands of the geologist when they're logging the core. So when they're going through um, the and, and logging the core, they can readily pick out these the features of interest, um, quickly compare those with other units. So here, um, we're looking at uh, little porphyritic units within a, a dolerite. Um, the porphyritic units uh, stand out. You can pick out the porphyritic units. Um, you can tell that the, the units themselves are similar, so they're, they're likely of the same generation. Um, and it, it puts a lot of more information into the, into the hands of the logger, so that really what the result is is faster, more consistent logging. Uh, getting the objective data so that uh, the, the better results come out. And what that leads to is more information uh, to make your decisions on. And that's it. Thank you.
Thanks, Fred. Uh, do we have any questions for Fred? Okay, still nothing. If you do think of any questions and you would like to ask them or if you'd like to meet up with myself and Louis, uh, drop me a mail and uh, we're more than happy to answer any questions for you. Our next yeah, speaker today... Oh, oh hang on, I sorry. Was gonna, I was just going to say if there's any... Um, if anybody wants any details on, on, on anything, they can they can contact me. My my email's there so, as well. Fred is in Perth, so just remember the time difference. Don't wake him up in the middle of the night. Well, e email's safe. <laughs> Our next speaker today is Dr. Sashel Panchal, who is the Global Product Manager of Automated Mineralogy. Sasha is the leading expert in spectral geology and her Acerus cloud-based spectral interpretation software is industry-leading technology. Sasha was one of the first independent consultants working in providing spectral analysis services in, to the Minix industry global, globally. In the past 28 years, she has played an important part in the industry, take up of the technology. Acerus is the realization of her desire to make spectral geology and mineralogy easily acceptable accessible to all geoscientists and embodies 30 years of experience. An increasing number of companies that want to use handheld spectrometer data as an input into the alteration modeling are adopting the system across their operations because of the game-changing effect of having fast, standardized and accurate mineralogy, mineralogical data. I'm actually just going to leave Sasha to continue yeah, with this because I'm that's totally... A lot there, isn't it? It's a bit long, that one. <laughs> Thanks, Marlene. <laughs> thank you. Okay, now thank you everybody for uh, coming to, uh, to the webinar. Um, so I'm going to talk about digital mineralogy um, and also, you know, where, where it, uh, why it's important in exploration and mining. If I can actually get the, uh, get my, hold on a minute. For some reason, I'm not able to progress. There we go. That'll work. There we go. So, okay. So my talk is uh, I'm going to look at um, uh, mineralogy, why it's important, uh, and uh, ways of how we can most effectively gather the mineralogy data um, and analyze the data. I'll give you a few examples of some case studies and and look at uh, the future and where we're going with it. Uh, so firstly, just to give you a, an overview then of uh, why it's important. So uh, we have here uh, the, the full life cycle of, of a project uh, from exploration all the way through to mining. Uh, and uh, so mineralogy is, is very important at every stage of, of this process. Uh, at the exploration stage where we're pretty much sampling material like soils or outcrop or, or shallow drilling, um, RC material, um, and maybe some diamond drilling as well in some of the more exciting projects. What we're looking for at this point is to understand the mineralogy to get a feel for uh, do we have any alteration signatures in our project? Can we actually vector towards interesting parts of the system and, and start to make decisions about where to drill next uh, and, and whether you know we're expanding our exploration or not? Then um, the next stage of uh, the project really would be if it's starting to look really interesting is starting to define what we actually have here. And usually the drilling at this point is diamond drilling. And so the, the spectral or the, the mineralogy data is useful at this point to define more clearly the alteration signatures uh, and, and defining the extent of the deposit and the actual uh, alteration halo around it. And at this point, we can also start to uh, look at the minerals that we're seeing. And when I'm talking about minerals, I'm talking about the alteration minerals um, uh, that are occurring around our deposit. And, and that might actually present some potential issues when we actually come to mine. And then when actually at the mining stage, we're maybe sampling here, we might be bl uh, sampling blast holes or more diamond drilling. And at this point, you're actually trying to define the, the deposit much more and defining the, the halo around it. Uh, and then starting to build the uh, block models of the alteration mineralogy and understanding potentially problematic minerals. It's at this point that it's really important to start to define those minerals before you actually start to um, mine and, and, and process the, uh, the material because you can start to, you need to make those stockpiling decisions at this point. Um, if you're actually going into um, the, the actual plant feed at this time with, without that knowledge, then that's when you can start to get problems. Um, so 
um, to understand where your deleterious minerals are coming in, it's good to define that in the block models early on and then at the actual production stage, you're, you're then um, just refining the understanding and in case anything has got through um, into the plant. So that's sort of like the uh, overview of why it's important. Um, why, why should we use uh, near-infrared? Um, this type of data uh, has been a method that's been used for maybe 30 years in the, the industry um, to actually define a range of alteration minerals. Um, we can actually, using the infrared, we can determine a range of different uh, mineral types and associations. Um, so we can identify our, our alteration minerals, the clay minerals, and potentially problematic minerals. We can also analyze uh, the mineral chemistry and mineral crystallinity variations as well. Uh, and this allows us to um, develop alteration models at all stages of, of the, the project. And then also start to look at, uh, as I was mentioning, the sort of potential geotechnical or geometallurgical problems. Um, and uh, these are the kind of things that we can actually express with the, the spectral data. We can extract specific information. Here it's uh, the white microcrystallinity and mapping out higher regions of crystallinity in this particular mine, um, we were able to define a correlation between that, the infrared information and also the geotech information of uh, some friable zones within this, uh, this pit. And uh, so why use handheld? I mean, as, as some of you may know, there are a range of options for measuring uh, the uh, spectral um, infrared data from uh, samples. Um, my, my speciality really is using handheld because I feel that it's, it's a really easy way of getting alteration mineral information. The equipment is very easy to use and portable. You can take it um, easily to the field or the core shed. Uh, and, and it's really quick to actually collect large project-wide data sets. So if you have, uh, if you've taken it to the, the core shed and you have your, your drill core laid out, uh, you can collect, easily collect 500 spectra per day using the technique. The other thing as well, often people are using the, uh, the handheld spectrometers alongside uh, portable XRF or alongside uh, the geochemical analysis in a lab. Uh, and so you can actually be analyzing the mineralogy of the samples that you're also getting the geochemistry for. And so to integrate these data together is a very powerful way of using the two data sets. And uh, in the field, obviously, the, um, to actually get the, the best sample type uh, for your sample, um, it is best to, to use a crushed material, although you can do point measurements on core surfaces. Um, but if you're preparing samples for geochemistry, um, what we usually recommend is that you would take a split of the crush material before you go to the milling process to create the powders for the geochemical analysis. Uh, and, and this type of uh, crush material is actually um, created quite nicely using the reflex crusher, or you could be taking a, a split from the crush material uh, in, in the geochem lab as part of the, um, the, the sample preparation workflow. <clears throat> and the best, the, the, the advantages of this is that you're getting a bulk sample, a homogenized sample that represents the volume mineralogy of that sample. Uh, and, and also it's then the same sample that you're taking, getting the geochemical data from as well. So uh, I've got a few slides now where I'm going to just go into how we actually handle these types of data. Uh, so infrared spectrometers are, are capable of collecting from hundreds to maybe even one or 2,000 spectra per day, depending on you know, your, your program of work and what types of samples you're working on. And as I was mentioning before, each spectrum has got a whole many levels of information in it uh, from the mineralogy uh, and then also the mineral chemistry crystallinity, and also you can um, quantitatively map out the relative proportions of the minerals that are detected in, in the data. We can also calculate what are called spectral parameters from the data, uh, and that allows us to do even more with the, the, um, the spectral data, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But how can all this information be easily available to the geologist? So there are a number of steps we can go through. Uh, step one is uh, getting the accurate mineral interpretation. Uh, what we need often in these types of samples, we're getting quite complex mixtures of minerals uh, in, a, in a bulk sample, for example. Uh, and it's, it's potentially that the, it could be that the dominant minerals are actually not telling you the full story. We need to go to the subordinate minerals actually to get the interesting information. 
and then this is commonly the case in, in alteration systems where you had complex history of overprinting uh, or for example in a lateritic weathering profiles you could, you've got the weathering overprint on top of your alteration as well. So uh, this is why we developed the ACIRA system for interpreting uh, these types of data uh, because the mineralogy from the infrared presents us with a very complex problem and, and it's really best suited to analyze these spectra using machine learning approach. And um, the ACIRIS um, system is actually um, built on, or the, the Sirius um, uh, um, ML models are um, built around real world geological data sets from a whole range of, of uh, geological settings. And in that data set, we've got uh, 2 million spectra that are actually in the training set from a range of different types of spectrometers, a uh, range of different geologies, different users. So we have a, a representation within that training set that represents how a particular mineral might occur under variable conditions. Uh, and so well, we're teaching the AI system into how to recognize these minerals. In, in uh, other methods that are used, uh, usually people use um, museum collections of spectra uh, of samples of pure mineral samples and, and try to create an interpretation method out of that. But that is not necessarily um, the best way because of the, um, the variability that you have in, in any type of geology for a start. And also uh, there's so many variables that get into the spectra associated even with the, the spectrometer used or the operator. And so the AI really is a method to uh, become, create a more robust uh, method for interpreting the spectra. And so uh, our Sirius system has got the 2 million real world spectra training set. Each one of those spectra has been interpreted by a human spectral expert at, at an expert level of interpretation accuracy. And that information has gone into our training. Uh, and then we've actually, out, out of that, we've got our AI models. So just an example here uh, of uh, a project in Indonesia uh, from Bali, uh, a recent discovery of theirs. And this is a, a picture from, or a, an image from uh, Burroughs et al uh, in economic geology. This uh, data set was put together by uh, using a, a handheld spectrometer, taking point measurements systematically on the core surface. Uh, and, and with the, the serious information that we could provide to them, they were getting uh, enough detail that they were able to map out where they were getting the high temperature zones uh, as well as um, getting a real good um, representation of what the alteration is in the system. <clears throat> and this method of, of point measurements uh, is actually being demonstrated in, in a large number of projects um, through time and, and, and around the world. The next step of actually handling these data is to actually uh, take the, the results and start to um, analyze the data in a little bit more detail. So we have already our digital mineralogy, which was from step one. The next step really is to look at the spectral um, plots and, and actually extract certain characteristics such as wavelengths or depths of diagnostic features, uh, which we call spectral parameters, uh, but you might be more familiar with them being called scalars or, or spectral indices. And these are numerical data that you can extract from the spectra that represent very specific uh, mineral variations in the spectral data. And because they're numerical, they can be modeled in the same way that we model geochemical data. So we can start to build scatter plots of the data, we can start to build histograms of the data uh, and then visualize the information in, um, in 3D. So I'd like to just show you through the thought process around maybe doing an analysis of uh, white mica. So uh, the white mica clays are a very common uh, mineral that's uh, occurred, occurs in a, a whole range of different uh, alteration systems. Um, and uh, it, it's a really easy one to detect in the infrared. And so what we can do with, with white mica, we can actually look at the, uh, the chemistry of the white mica, looking at the aluminium content or the iron-magnesium ratio of the white micas. Uh, and we look at, we actually analyze this by analysis of one of the diagnostic white mica absorptions, uh, which is called the ALOH absorption. So what we would do is take that absorption feature, and, and the Sirius does this automatically. Uh, we can actually take that absorption feature, find the minimum, and take a measure of the wavelength position of that minimum. And that number then goes into the, uh, the database 
uh, and we have a whole range of the white mica wavelengths and that those wavelengths then relate directly to a certain type of white mica. And what we might see is that if we plot that wavelength of ALOH uh, as a histogram for a particular project, we might see the, uh, the, the, the ALOH of the white mica is actually partitions into perhaps two populations of white mica, which are indicating to us that we have two phases of white mica occurring in our project. Uh, and, and what we often see is that one of the phases is related to uh, a proximal uh, alteration phase where we have a mineralizing event, uh, and another phase may be related to a more distal or earlier or later stage of, of white mica alteration. So um, by reducing the spectral data to these numbers, we can do you know, a lot of analysis. Okay, go to the next one. So the white micas um, allow us to, uh, so this is the, the Terry Leach, um, Corbett and Leach diagram that um, a lot of people will be common with, uh, <clears throat> familiar with. Uh, and this diagram shows you the pH on the x-axis and the temperature increasing as you go down on this axis. So the white micas will show crystallinity variations in some uh, alteration systems related to temperature, and they show chemistry variations that are related to uh, the, the, the chemistry of the, the mineralizing fluids. Uh, and they can be really important to actually help us understand the history and evolution of the alteration system. So in taking our example that I showed before of the two populations, if we plot these up as um, the, um, uh, the two populations of white mica, the paragonitic white mica in this particular alteration system is, is proximal to the mineralization, whereas the muscovite is more distal. And this allows us to uh, then start to vector in towards um, mineralization um, and finding more interesting areas. How am I going for time, Nolene? Am I going okay? All good. Definitely. Yeah, good. Okay, <laughs> great. So this is another example. So the previous one is, is to do with drilling. So this is maybe about 4,000 uh, spectra on uh, downhole drilling. And uh, but sometimes, obviously, when we're looking at um, weather terrain, like we have in Australia or, or in, in Africa, uh, we might be doing shallow drilling and, and just collecting samples at the end of the hole as soon as we, we start to hit the weathered basement. Um, and this is a, a, a study that was done quite some time ago by Scott Halley and, and the Placer Dome crew in, in, in Australia around the Canal Bell area. And uh, they did just a regional sampling um, at end of hole and were able to map out the white mica chemistry. And we could see a very distinctive halo around where we're getting the, the Canal Bell uh, system and uh, compared to what was happening further, more distally. And so it's a really powerful method to uh, be able to analyze spectral data. And just because you know we we're, uh, have very similar uh, environments between Australia and, and Africa when we're dealing with these overprinting of these deep weathering profiles, I just wanted to bring this in to, to show you that we can do a lot within this sort of profile as well uh, using the infrared. So the infrared data allows us to detect the key alteration minerals such as kaolinite and the smectites. Uh, and uh, using that, those, these clay minerals, we can separate the uh, upper saprolytic material from the lower saprolite by looking at the, uh, the relative proportions of kaolinite and smectite. So we've got kaolinite on the y-axis here and smectite on the x-axis. Uh, and so the kaolinite examples plot up here and the smectitic samples plot uh, in this line. And as we go down, we're getting decrease in kaolinite and smectite down into the fresh rock. Um, we can also look at the, the actual smectite type, which gives us a clue as to what the, um, the original rock type composition was. <clears throat> so this is an example of that, where we've actually done an end of hole survey. Um, this is over a project in, in um, the Northern Territories in Australia. And using the, uh, the kaolinite crystallinity and the smectite type, we were able to separate um, where these end of hole samples hadn't actually got through into the basement. So all the blues and purples represent where we're still in transported material. Uh, and then the, uh, the yellows represent where we're in the upper saprolite, which is intent, you know, very leached. So uh, not a very good sample for geochemical analysis. And then uh, the other colors represent the lower saprolite material. Um, and the 
the smectites in that lower saprolite material gives us a clue about the, the, the actual original rock type. <clears throat> so we were able to identify the intermediate volcanics and mafix and ultramafics in this project area. But basically what this allows to do, if you're combining the, the spectral, the mineralogy um, from the spectral data and the geochemical data, uh, you can actually get an appreciation of which of these holes are actually worth um, getting the geochemical data from, um, whether obviously you don't want to take any of the data from the cover samples and you want to be reasonably into the basement material to actually uh, have a good sample. <clears throat> And the final step really is into taking that information and integrating it with other data sets because uh, the spectral mineralogy is just a layer of information um, that uh, is available, but obviously by itself, it's, it's not as powerful as when it's integrated. Uh, and we have uh, several uh, diagrams and templates in IOGAS where you can use the serious results to analyze things such as the white mica type uh, and also chloride and alunite. And we have some uh, regolith um, profile diagrams in there as well. And in this platform uh, with IOGAS, obviously you're also bringing in your geochemical data. This is where you start, can start to integrate those data in with the spectral data. The, uh, the VNIR shortwave infrared part of the spectrum um, will analyze mostly your clay minerals and hydrated and hydroxylated silicates and carbonates. And there are some minerals that we're not able to detect at these wavelengths with the handheld spectrometers. Uh, and this is where we, when we integrate uh, whole rock geochemistry with the spectral data, we potentially could then bring in information uh, for those minerals that we're not able to detect with the infrared. So this is a figure from Scott Halley again, um, showing how he incorporates whole rock geochemistry with the spectral mineralogy to get a, a comprehensive um, <clears throat> mineral identification for the project. Uh, so where um, the clay minerals and so on are very difficult to actually work with with the geochemical data, the spectral data satisfies that part of the piece uh, and uh, the whole rock geochemistry can provide us more information about the those anhydrous minerals that we're not detecting in the handheld spectrometry. <clears throat> and then finally, of course, uh, as, as, as uh, Fred was saying earlier, what we want to start to do is, is to make all this more readily available to the user uh, and alongside uh, geophysics and geochemistry and the spectral mineralogy. And we can start to provide these virtual drill cores really to the, um, the core logging geologists. So they have this information at hand uh, and they can actually look at the core maybe one time instead of having to pull that core out more than um, that time and have a this, the chief geologist as well can be more confident about the, the logging that is um, actually uh, going on because uh, they, they know that their geologists have got the information at their fingertips. <clears throat> so what does all this mean? Uh, well, basically, just to go back really to the, the beginning of this session, uh, we really need to know our rocks. Uh, mineralogy is an important part of that, but obviously it's only one part of the piece and we also need or the other information as well to bring it together to build us that rock knowledge. Um, from what I've seen and in my experience is that handheld spectrometers are still the fastest and most cost effective way of collecting large project wide data sets uh, and mineralogy information. Um, we've seen since we've um, developed a series and got it available there for industry, <clears throat> there has been an upsurge in interest. Excuse me. <coughs> So, <clears throat> just as well, I'm at the end. <laughs> so it's just opened up these data to a wider <clears throat> audience. <clears throat> and the digital mineralogy then is 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 now available <clears throat> as an important component for the geoscience data ecosystem. Thank you very much. I managed to get it out. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, and uh, please contact me by email if uh, we don't have time to answer your question today. Thanks so much, Sasha, um, especially because Sasha's sitting in New Zealand, <laughs> so it's quite uh -huh. late at night already for her, and we do appreciate your time. Um, Pleasure. There was a question for Louis from Eddie Dixon. I'm going to read it out again, Louis, if you're available, um, just did. so that everybody can... 
just so everybody can hear your answer, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I did answer the question, uh, Marlene. Okay. And um, could everybody see Louis' answer in the chat, or did it just go to Eddie? Oh, there I've lost you. Oh, okay. Um, okay, I'm just going to read it out so everybody can, can hear it. The question from Eddie was, um, on your plan strategy, do you see this as formal agreement with, say, drilling contractors going forward? or informal as it is currently. Uh, so Louis' reply was, I believe it is important for the parties to firstly understand the benefits of the relationship, and based on the nature of the project, the relationship can be formalized. So at the moment, the relationships are currently still informal. Uh, but Eddie, yo, give us a call. Louis is going to be more than happy to chat about that. Um, there was another question from Raynard, um, sitting in Zambia at Kansanshi Man. Raynard, thanks for joining us. Always great to have you on, on board and with us. Um, the question was to do with the Hub RQ um, uh, development. And um, listen, I, I'm more than happy to have a chat with you offline. Uh, but what I would like to say is we're continuously working on research and development. We're continuously refining uh, our software, especially the Hub. You know, it is the this the center of, of what we what we do. So we're continuously working on that. Um, and then again, Archeologer, uh, your question about research and development on that. Absolutely, we're always continuing to develop it. Um, so Raina, give me a call and we will take that conversation further. Um, are there any other questions? I haven't seen any other others. No, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, again, oh, hang on, here we, here we go. Let me just see. This is for Sasha. I would like to know if the crystallinity of palinite that was used was extracted from the XRD software. Mm, no, we actually, yeah, we, we can actually, oh, I'll just put this camera on. Um, we did a study uh, quite some time ago in, in Australia, uh, looking at the laterite profiles and kaolinite crystallinity. And that, that, in that study, we did do some comparative XID, uh, but we generated some methods of actually being able to measure the kaolinite crystallinity from the infrared data. So we can separate um, many more levels of kaolinite crystallinity in the infrared data uh, than you can in, in XID. So we can easily separate the um, disordered and poorly crystalline kaolinites that are typical of the transported material from the uh, upper saprolite kaolinites, which are usually highly crystalline. So um, that allows us to, to separate that the boundary or be able to detect the boundary between the transported and the, uh, the <clears throat> weathered basement uh, in, in those um, profiles. So yes, yeah, so it is within the infrared data, but it was based originally on with XRD comparison. Great, thanks so much, Sasha. Um, I do realize that uh, some people have been having uh, problems with connectivity. We have recorded the, the presentations and um, I will check with our speakers. We haven't done this yet. I'll check with our speakers about um, providing the, the presentations as well. So Naomi, yes, I've just re uh, replied to your uh, question. The recordings will be available later. Um, Hopefully you guys have all noticed that the um, the talks today were more of a geological bent. Um, so we will also be having a similar uh, event in June, probably towards the, end, the middle of the year. Um, hopefully we can have that as a breakfast. And at, at that one, we will be talking more about our, our drilling innovations and, and the new technologies that we've brought on board. If you have any other questions, um, please could you send them to me or to any of our speakers um, and we will address them offline. Do any of our speakers have anything else they'd like to say um, to wrap up or I can just wrap up and close the meeting? Yeah, no, I'm okay. Thank you, everybody. No, thank you. Anyone else yes, want you. to have
Anybody? Louise, sorry, were you trying to say something? Great. Well, guys, in that case, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's, it's always great to talk about our innovations and where we're going with MDEX. And as I've said probably about 10 times now, uh, please mail us with any other questions, comments, and um, we'll chat soon. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Have a lovely weekend.